All right. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mitzi Soretto, and I am here with Facebook Live. Uh, this is, um, gosh, I've lost count which episode this is, but this is uh, today for the best new true crime stories, Unsolved Crimes and Mysteries. I shall flash the book. And I am joined by Dean Job, who's uh, coming to us live from the uh, Atlantic Canada area. So, uh, Dean, how are you? No, no, I'm good. Thank you very much, oh, Mitzi. Dean, I don't hear you. Oh, uh, um, I'm uh, not uh -oh. muted. <laughs> we seem to have have uh, no sign. Can Dean, <laughs> no, no hearing. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. That's weird. Okay. Am I? Can you hear me now? Oh yeah. Okay. okay. You know what? I think I did something to screw up. But of course, <laughs> it always is like that. Okay. Hopefully, you can hear me. So, yeah, Dean, great, how great you? interview. Okay. Thanks for having me <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, it starts out with a bang, as it always does. <laughs> So, uh, you know what I keep waiting for, because this is now the third book in the series that you've been in, and I'm still waiting for my shipment of, of Nova Scotia smoked salmon, and it's not arrived yet. Well, uh, it's in the mail. <laughs> it's in the mail. Oh, great. Okay. God knows where it's going to end up in that case. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm really, uh, I'm really happy you're here to join, uh, join me today. Uh, you were on a, uh, an event we did uh, with books and books a while back. I think that was, um, which, which book was that we did? Was that the um, uh, Crimes of Passion, Obsession and Revenge? No, I think it was uh, Rogues, uh, Scoundrels and uh, uh, Mild Mannered Crooks. Oh, uh, Well Mannered Crooks, Rogues and Criminals? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe many. it was. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. I can't even keep track of anything anymore. But um, so, uh, well, Dean's here today. He's going to, he wrote a really, really interesting story uh, for the book, um, The Curious Case. I have to actually read the title. It's so, <laughs> uh, The Curious Case of the Dogs in the Nighttime, France's Valley of Hell Mystery. We need to cue some eerie music here. <laughs> Um, so tell us a bit about uh, the story. Now, where and when does this story take place? Well, it's in uh, 1929 in uh, Provence. And, uh, you know, how a, a writer in Nova Scotia, Canada, finds a story like this. I was, I was actually just uh, doing some general research around another uh, murder in Nice about that time. And uh, happened upon this case of the murder or the 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 death uh, in very suspicious circumstances of Olive Branson, who was a uh, socialite and artist uh, from London, from England, who uh, summered in uh, in Provence. And uh, if the name Branson rings a bell, she is a uh, her cousin is the uh, grandfather, great grandfather of Sir Richard Branson. So it had a little uh, cachet, but what it really had was the most bizarre circumstances, uh, I think, imaginable. Uh, Olive Branson's body is found uh, in the cistern or water tank out behind her little villa in uh, the countryside of Provence. Uh, she had been shot once through the head. Uh, the gun was at the bottom of the uh, cistern. And unbelievably, uh, the local constabulary, when they took a look, deemed it a suicide, um, believing that someone would, uh, in their inner night clothes, would step into uh, a cistern uh, with water up to her neck and commit suicide. Well, it wasn't. And uh, a crack investigator uh, detective is brought in from Marseille, who finds blood in the villa, and it's very clear that it was a murder. Um, but then the question became, who did it? And the, the title, um, I'm sure many of your listeners, uh, many of the viewers will, will recognize that as a Sherlock Holmes reference to uh, one of his stories where the curious incident of the dogs in the night, dog in the nighttime is the dog doesn't bark. And that's exactly what happened here. And that was certainly key evidence leading to uh, the charging of someone that knew Branson and knew the dogs. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the fact that, as you mentioned, that this was even anyone, anyone in the police force who could actually have come up with thinking this was suicide is just so bizarre. I mean, um, either, I, I'm assuming they just wanted to put pay to it and not be bothered about having to investigate anything. 
Well, when I when I look in true crime, um, I enjoy historical true crime because it's such a great way to get a sense of good and bad, how people thought at at a given time. And uh, as I write in the, in the chapter, I mean the misogyny and the uh, the uh, the the. Uh, the attitude towards women is on uh, just horrible display here uh, because the uh, the defense when uh, her younger lover, Francois Pinet, local boy, is charged with the murder, the defense is suicide, trying to build on this idea that uh, she uh, uh, committed suicide, uh, that she might have been despondent over some of her artwork not being accepted in London. I mean, no one who knew her believed this because there was no, you know, there, there, her life seemed to be on track. And, uh, uh, but this this uh, uh, idea uh, that uh, she actually, and the, the defense actually really rested on the idea that out of spite, because she feared she was going to be dumped by her young lover, she staged the suicide to look like a murder. So uh, it, and this all really happened. I mean, it was, it was like some of these uh, bizarre mysteries you see where either a, a murder has been disguised as a suicide or a suicide as uh, uh, masks uh, uh, a, uh, or murder is made to look like a suicide. And, and in this case had both. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, um, I, I, I've, I've come across that before where, in, and especially it's a great, uh, it's a great plot line to come up with this thing where the uh, person has basically killed themselves, but to frame someone else, the ultimate revenge. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty outlandish. Um, uh, Backtrack a little bit on um, the, the sure. Valley of Hell. Kind of, um, kind of uh, give us a scenario. What, what is why? I mean, that's a horrible name. I mean, can you imagine saying, "No, let's go visit the Valley of Hell"? Sounds like a great place. But uh, why is it called the Valley of Hell? Well, it's not exactly Chamber of Commerce uh, <laughs> approved. That's for sure. Uh, it's uh, um, it um, it was because an early travel writer went there, and it's it's a very dry, very arid. It's inland, so it's it's not sort of coastal Provence you think about, and uh, lots of bizarre rock formations. Uh, in fact, in fact, the village she lived in was called Les Beaux, which means the box, and um, that was actually uh, the name of bauxite aluminum ore came from that area. Well, it it didn't really bring many riches to this area, and in fact. Um, there was a really a, a ruined village of Lebo that uh, uh, tourists would come to see. It was like a ghost town. And, um, and again, it was just this dry uh, area. And a, an early travel writer thought, you know, compared it to something out of Dante. And <laughs> that's where the idea of, uh, of the Valley of Hell was uh, first sort of dubbed, dubbed on this area. You know, it sounds like an, a, a rather peculiar place for someone who's an artist to um, choose, especially an artist who had some means and could pretty much pick where she wished to live. <laughs> well, one of the things that made all of Branson, uh, I suppose, so susceptible to the kind of defamation after her death, you know, that she might have engineered a suicide to frame her lover, uh, was well, she was a very unconventional woman for the time. Uh, she had been a nurse in the World War. Uh, was all set to marry a French officer. He was killed in the war. She ends up marrying a, a British author, a, a officer that she met uh, overseas. Um, but uh, within 12, uh, two weeks, uh, their marriage, they split up. They stay married, but they never live together again. And um, she, um, she was an artist. So she was very unconventional. She, uh, she enjoyed painting gypsies and actually... Uh, geared up a, a wagon, a gypsy themed wagon, and joined gypsies in the uh, English countryside. And, and, you know, I don't think today this kind of bohemian lifestyle would be, uh, would be looked at as a scans, but it was scandalous in uh, at the time. And, um, you know, she was even uh, derided for, uh, why would she do this when, you know, as a, a well, a fairly well off woman, uh, with uh, uh, 
aristocratic connections, you know, should have married well. Uh, so really what was on trial here was an independent minded woman who, yeah. So you say, why would she move to this valley of hell? Well, I, I guess because she, she did whatever she damn well pleased. And um, it did inspire her art. She had a studio in her villa and uh, would roam the hills with her four dogs, uh, the uh, aforementioned four dogs who don't bark the night she's murdered. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, she just sounds like somebody that would have been just a fascinating person to know. I mean, uh, uh, just the fact that she she really was a nonconformist and she really didn't want to just be put in a box that she, you know, I remember in the story you mentioned that uh, there was a lot of commentary in, in newspapers about like, you know, well, she could have gone and married. So, you know, this and had this kind of life as if that's the only life that was available to women, which I suppose in a way it was. But um, that took a lot of courage to sort of uh, just say the hell with it. I'm doing what I want. And it's a real tragedy, too, because... Uh, it ends up her her lover, uh, Francois Pinet, he's uh, uh, considerably younger, about 18 years younger than her. Um, she uh, she confided to friends that, uh, you know, she was over, head over heels for him. And uh, which does lead to, you know, the idea that uh, either he wanted out of the relationship or, or they feuded in some way that led to uh, her being killed. But certainly, you know, she she lived life on her terms and by all accounts had never been happier. She had the freedom of being away from prying eyes in uh, in uh, in London, uh, doing what she wanted to do and not caring if anybody minded that she had this young French lover. Uh, so, again, it's a real tragedy when this happens and even more of a tragedy when it's it's ultimately uh, used to defame her after her death. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems to me from from reading your story, in a way, there was more objection to her lifestyle than there was to the fact that she ended up murdered. Well, yeah, if you want outrage, there should have been outrage that, yeah. a, uh, that a British national living in the south of France in 1929 could uh, could be murdered. And it could be and uh, and uh, the initial investigation anyway could be botched so badly. Yeah, I know. There was sort of this uh, Clouseau element with, with some of the police at the uh, early part of the, uh, quote, investigation. I just kept thinking of Clouseau. I don't know why. <laughs> well, then it, it does become a very much a very interesting procedural. One of the things I was fascinated with in was the difference of the... Uh, of the uh, system in France. And uh, a, a famous American journalist, Janet Flanner, um, ended up covering a lot of, of, uh, of uh, very sensational court cases in the 1920s and 30s as a Paris correspondent and for, uh, for American magazines. And uh, so I was able to get her to sort of introduce the readers to what was going on. But the initial stage is called the, uh, you appear before a juge d'instruction, instructing judge. And uh, basically this judge's role is to just have at the defendant <laughs> and accuse him every way he can. I mean, it's very brutal compared to the sort of uh, innocent till proven guilty attitude here. I mean, you've got a judge who's really uh, this uh, aggressive prosecutor putting various scenarios to uh, to the accused. So it was very interesting to see that. But as well, um, once uh, the Marseille police are brought in, they have an up to date crime lab. They do a crackerjack. Uh, uh, job of proving its murder, despite the fact that this idea of a spite suicide or a spiteful suicide um, persists. But they uh, uh, conclusively uh, uh, established that it was a murder. Uh, the question was, and the problem was, could they tie the accused Pinay to being to the crime to be a murder, and that was problematic. So uh, he, it was a very compelling circumstantial case, but it came up short in terms of, and that's why it's still a mystery. Came up short in terms of actual um, uh, physical evidence linking him to the crime. 
Well, and also, I mean, uh, p and we're talking, this is a small uh, village, and, and uh, so obviously people are going to uh, rally around him and not believe he's capable of killing someone. I mean, I got that from the story, too. Well, uh, one of the journalists, I, I talk about one of the journalists parachuted in from London, basically says, you know, this is supposed to be part of France, but it's more part of the Middle Ages. I mean, it was very <laughs> rural. It was very much off the beaten track. I mean, when the, the chief industry is a, uh, a deserted uh, ghost town village and they're living off tourism, uh you know, it, it gives a sense that things hadn't changed there very much over the years. And, um, you know, it was very much a small town, a small community. There was a sense of rallying around. Uh, and uh, two other key witnesses or uh, um, figures in the case were uh, the gardener and the gardener's wife. And as luck would have it, the gardener's wife was Pinay's sister. <laughs> so uh, all roads led to Pinay in a sense. And, uh, yeah. uh, 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 but, you know, the, the, the problem was uh, uh, this inability to find, and, and uh, because of the French system, it wasn't like he could sit on his hands. I mean, he's actually being challenged in the courtroom you know, at one point, the prosecutor, you know, threatens him with the guillotine because if he was convicted of murder, he could be guillotined and dramatically points at the clock and says, look, Pinay, there's still time. Confess while he's on the witness stand. Right. I mean, Perry Mason was a little more subtle than that. Yeah, this yeah. That's very dramatic and <laughs> melodramatic, I should say. It sounds like, like, a, a, one, of, like a, one of those really bad film noirs. <laughs> Yes, yeah. So it was it was really it was really f fun if that's the word. It was really intriguing to um to really immerse uh, try to immerse myself but also to immerse readers in this other time and place and uh you know um uh, well who doesn't want a journey to the south of France during during COVID, uh, if you can't get there yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's what we used to write. But you know, I think I think the sense of uh, your enjoyment in writing the piece comes through in the story. I mean, you could just see how much you're enjoying it by reading it. It really comes through. Well, I mean, again, it's 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 frustrating to see the undertones and well, the, the blatant. They're yeah. not undertones, overtones, I guess. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, I really. I really enjoy bringing another time, a little, a lost world to life. And uh, this case is not well known. I, I don't think it had been written about since the 1930s. So I always enjoy a little bit of an historical scoop like that. But, uh, but as I put the pieces together, uh, yeah, I thought, uh, you know, it was a really um, um, illuminating story. And uh um, I guess one of the problems with the, the unsolved crimes and mysteries uh, title, uh, Mitzi, is uh, uh, you can't say is, I haven't given any spoiler alerts here when I say there were problems with the uh, the trial or the, the case against the accused. But, um, you know, at the time it was suggested that what really happened would be a mystery forever. And um, almost a century later, yeah, it's still... Um, I mean, I think it'll be clear to readers what happened, but uh, it's still a, a no one ever, a spoiler alert, no one's ever brought to justice successfully for uh, for what happened. Yeah, and also with a with a historical piece, uh, it, it's, I mean, there have been cases where, where crimes have been solved, but it's just the likelihood is, is a lot less. I mean, one of the things I've mentioned when I was doing the book was my concern that by the time it got published, if some of the cases might have been solved by then, then it kind of, you know, kind of scuppers the whole idea. But um, uh, with something historical, it just uh, less, a lot less likely, which I, I think is probably one of the fun things about working on something historical. Yeah, well, just, well, you're welcome. I held up my end anyway. This one's still not solved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but I mean, so you, but you just came across this. I mean, uh, uh, I, 
refresh my memory again, how did you actually come across this case? Well, uh, if you Google murder in Provence in the 19, or, and I think I, the year, I was curious, um, I, I, uh, you know, that's one thing that Mitzi, in her business, we get curious about some really bizarre things. And <laughs> and I hope I hope uh, the police never have a, a cause to like to look at our uh, browser uh, history. <laughs> but I, I was just uh, trying to find out about murders in Provence, 1931. I started working back and uh, I was curious about how uh, uh, murders of foreign nationals were dealt with for this for another project. And I stumbled on this. And, uh, you know, on the other project, I thought had legs for a book. This one I knew didn't, but I thought it's a really cool story. And I I do, uh, every other month, I do a, a, a short, uh, a, a true crime story for, uh, for Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. And uh, I initially thought maybe it would go there. And then your call for, uh, we got to know each other and your call went out. And I thought it would be good for this. And... Um, uh, you know, my column's called Stranger Than Fiction. So this was this was a story right up my alley in terms of it's almost a Ripley's, believe it or not, um, uh, story. So, so yeah, so it was just um, randomly searching the internet. Not randomly. I guess I was searching with a purpose, but I stumbled over it. And uh, it's one of the joys of historical research. Uh, you know, you, you just don't know what you're going to find. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, you know, I, I kind of wonder because there's as there's a lot of um, stories in the book that a, a theme has kind of developed, and and a lot of it is again that that you know victim blaming women, you know, uh, monitoring their lifestyles, judging them for their lifestyles or their perceived lifestyles, and it seems that several stories in the book have have played that up. Um, do you think if Olive were alive today, um, how different? Do you think this would have been handled? Um, well, I think forensic. Well, here's the thing. I mean, it, it was a small place. So the local constable uh, should have been more suspicious than he was. The local coroner declared it uh, suicide without very much. I mean, there was so much to give pause. And it yeah. was only after her relatives in England said, you know, that's that's outlandish, no way it was suicide, that it really got the second look it deserved. So, you know, there is that problem of, uh, of something in a small town. But, you know, between the lines, it really felt like uh, it was like, leave well enough alone, or because she wasn't, I mean, uh, let's ask the question this way. If she'd been a member of the community, would the police have taken it seriously or more seriously initially? I think so. Did the French police take it seriously when prodded? Yes, they did. Like I said, they did an excellent investigation. They had one of the top crime labs in Marseille and their work is here. Uh, the uh, chief forensics guy who worked on the case uh, wrote a textbook on, uh, on forensics uh, of the time. So uh, there was all of that. Um, I think the, I think the outcome would have been, um, again, reasonable doubt, which still did exist in France in the French system. Um, and the lack of direct evidence was problematic in terms of a conviction, but the, I think this uh, suicide theory which was the defense. And, and I think that would have failed. I think it would have been laughed out of court. And it yeah. was remarkable to me that even years after uh, a couple of feature writers who, uh, who uh, looked at the case, just bought that, uh, you know, just swallowed that idea whole that it was um, a spite suicide. So, um, you know, go figure. But I, I do think that, uh, yeah, well, I think there'd at least be an online, you know, I think there'd be like hashtag, are you kidding me or something like that now, if anyone tried to, you know, try to seriously advance such an outlandish idea. There'd probably be about 10 Olive Branson podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there will be yet. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, now instead of just general true crime podcasts, there's podcasts focusing on specific cases. So you can bet on that, um, especially with the Branson connection. I mean, that that to me would be like something that would attract people's attention. I mean, that's one of the things that when you sent, talked to me about the story, I'm like, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> and, uh, you know, that I wasn't searching 
um, Branson or anything. I mean, yeah. when I saw the name kind of, you know, I thought, well, I wonder if, and then sure enough, it didn't take much research to trip over the name of her cousin who was the uh, great grandfather. So, yeah. So I knew that there was a direct connection and I thought, yeah, well, that's, that's kind of neat anyway. Um, but, uh, I'm curious whether he knows that about this story. I don't know if it was passed down through the family or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's just a shame because, um, you know, one of the things I was thinking of, um, uh, as we were saying, how uh, the attitude toward her and the condemnation of her lifestyle and the eyebrow raising kind of attitudes, um, you would think in today's world, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But I think we've seen time and time again that um, women who tend to be, you know, more bohemian or nonconformist and, and just want to live their lives on their own terms are still somehow persecuted and condemned for it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which is, um, which is uh, sobering, I guess. And, uh, you know, it's true. Uh, maybe one of the values of, of looking back like this is to say, you know, enough. You know, this, this isn't some new idea you've come up with. I mean, this has been outlandish for a century and uh, it's time to stop. And uh, uh, I mean, it's not, there's no comfort in it, but I mean, it's, uh, it's a reminder that it's high time, you know, people moved on and, uh, and uh, you know, attitudes changed. And uh, um, in one way, it's comforting to look back and say, wow, people don't think much differently. But in, when they think like this, yeah, it's pretty frustrating. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. It's, it's a shame we haven't progressed enough in uh, what are we, we're talking 100 years, but uh, I don't know. Um, now, you're actually, um, I'm really excited because you've, you've been in two other books that um, in the series. Uh, you've been in the uh, Crimes of Passion, Obsession and Revenge book. And you have been in the um, Well-Mannered Crooks, Rogues and Criminals book. So I'm scoring a code getting you here today. <laughs> trifecta <laughs> yeah and, and each and, and those pieces as well were historical um do you ever do uh, do you ever do anything more contemporary or is it just not of interest to you well um i was a newspaper reporter and, and editor for uh for years so uh, and my, i started out covering the courts so i've done my share of uh of, of true of contemporary true crime as a journalist um i then at one point uh started uh, investigating uh, and I became an investigative journalist. I started investigating a, uh, a mine explosion here in Nova Scotia that killed 26 miners and it was a huge national scandal. Uh, and uh, that turned into a criminal case. So I felt like I couldn't get away from contemporary true crime at times. But I, um, I, I was covering cases, my background was in history and those two interests kind of coincided. I would hear about, I mean, law, law is all about precedent. So it's not uncommon in a court ruling or even in the courtroom to hear a case from 50 or 100 years ago mentioned. So sometimes I, I chase these cases and start writing little features. And I, um, so I, I sort of put my two um, uh, interests coincided or I put them together. My... Uh, my uh, need to understand the criminal law process for my job and the cases I was seeing, but my interest in then taking that back and uh, looking at historic cases. So I guess that's, that's where I am now. That's what I, uh, uh, that's what I enjoy doing. I, I mean, I, I read some contemporary true crime as well, um, but um, um, I'm sort of there now. I'm not, I wouldn't rule out doing something a, a little more recent, but that, might be the 1950s for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're even saying now even 20 years ago is considered historical. <laughs> that's, a, that's a depressing thought, but yeah. yeah. But, but the one advantage, be, I imagine too, as well as uh, the journalism thing with that, with that deadline. I mean, we all have deadlines, obviously, if we're writing a story for someone or if we have a book contract, we have a deadline. But journalism, that kind of deadline is breathing fire down the neck deadline and I bet you don't miss that too much no I was it was quite a bit younger then but uh um no I remember covering two three four hearings on a day and just being happy if I could keep them all straight not, yeah. put, the wrong judge, not put the wrong judge in the wrong story or something but, uh, the wrong I, but I really enjoyed uh I mean I um 
I had a front row seat in the justice system for four years. So it really does help me uh, with what I do now. And, uh, um, but uh, uh, I may not miss those daily deadlines, but uh, I think you'd agree, Mitzi, it certainly makes you more productive because it, it makes you self-motivated and uh, um, it does, I think I'm, I'm hoping I hit my deadlines for you. I'm not walking into a trap here, am I? That, no. Uh, no <laughs> but no, uh, you no it's, turn it's this wonderful, clean coffee and you're always on time. Well, that's, I don't have to do a lot of work on you. <laughs> that's from the, that's from that daily pressure, I think, but uh, it, nothing focuses the mind like a deadline. And, and when you've got one at uh, say six thirty every day, yeah, it, the ones for, two to three weeks or even a, a year out seem more manageable. You learn to, uh, uh, well, to work ahead and, uh, um, you know, you understand the importance of a deadline. Yeah. Although sometimes if you think you've got all that time, it's, uh, you kind of have that manana manana attitude. <laughs> 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 I won't, I won't deny that that happens, but, uh, um, but I, uh, well, I, I, I do, I pride myself on beating deadlines when I can. Um, you know, so, uh, um, I mean, I've, I've got a deadline in March and the column's written, so, uh, I'm not everything, but I, I do, uh, I do try that. And, uh, um, uh, well, that, me that means I'll fall behind on something else, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Something, something else suffers for it. Someone has asked a question. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with this, but I guess she imagines you might be, uh, she's asking what's going on with the honey and Barry Sherman case. Oh, well, uh, I, I know about the case. That's the billionaire couple uh, found uh, uh, murdered in their uh, um, uh, in their uh, home in Toronto, their uh, their mansion in Toronto. And, and the, the viewer is actually kind of uh, right on to ask about that, because that was a case that initially had had uh, uh, the look of or, or was thought to maybe be a murder suicide it's now recognized to be uh, uh, a double murder uh, I don't have any uh, uh, there's a uh, a uh, an author named uh, Ken Donovan who uh, has been uh, uh, working away on that uh, and uh, he uh, uh, wrote a book called uh, uh, the billionaire murders and uh, uh, he has been tenacious in uh, in uh, holding investigators' feet to the fire and in, in ferreting out information. But uh, I'd, I'd refer you to to Google on on the latest on that. But as it stands, uh, nobody's been charged. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, I, it's Kevin Donovan. I think I gave the wrong name, but uh, I, I'd say check out his book if you hadn't heard of it. Uh, it certainly makes a compelling case. It's it's really his investigation of these murders, and he has been the primary investigator for in this on the journalism side. Yeah, it's it's amazing how many journalists really do dig into these cases and solve them. I mean, uh, it's uh, I can't imagine personally going down that route. Uh, maybe I'm lazy, but uh, <laughs> I, I can't imagine it. But I have to really admire these people that uh, just get that stuck into it or two crime writers that get so stuck into a case that they they literally uncover the, you know, get the result. Well, I suppose in 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 terms of historical and nonfiction, you you do that sometimes, too. It may not be as as it's certainly not as timely, it may not seem to matter as much, but, uh, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the Olive Branson case, I think when you read my, my chapter, you'll, you'll have a pretty good idea what happened, what really happened. Um, but of course, um, things aren't always clear cut the guilty people aren't always convicted and, uh, and sometimes innocent people are convicted. So, uh, you know, you do have a chance to at least, uh, you can't change the past, but you can certainly, uh, gather the evidence and re-sift it and, uh, and uh, give people a better sense of what happened. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, do you um, have any uh, new projects you'd like to tell us about? Every, every time I get an email from you, there's a new book cover on your... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, um, um, I'm now working on a... Uh, uh, well, my thing is, is always true crime. Um, just because, again, it's just... Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's like history with drama built in, 
Yes. I mean, uh, there's, go there's going to be a dramatic story. A crime's committed. Someone's going to have to be caught, hunted down. Then the justice system is going to have to grapple with it. And they're always full of larger than life characters. So uh, the one I've, I've found now takes me back uh, a, a few, about uh, 10 years ago, I did a, uh, a book on the uh, uh, Leo Quartz, who was a, uh, a jazz age swindler in Chicago and actually the original Ponzi. He was well ahead of Charles Ponzi. He was running this huge Ponzi scheme claiming to have oil in Panama. And uh, he ends up uh, on the lamb in Nova Scotia, which is where I found the story. But I've always loved the 20s and the jazz age. So now I'm, I'm just uh, I'm getting close to finishing the first draft of a new book on a fellow named uh, Arthur Berry, who was a gentleman jewel thief in 1920s New York and uh, uh, preyed on the wealthy, cased wealthy estates. He sometimes dressed in tuxedos and crashed parties and could speak with enough of a Harvard uh, tainted or Harvard uh, tinged accent that nobody <laughs> caught on that he wasn't supposed to be there. And what he was doing was casing, casing the home, sometimes wandering upstairs to get the lay of the land, making sure certain windows were open so he could come back the next night or that night and uh, steal jewels. So it's an incredible story. Uh, millions, uh, even in 1920s terms, were stolen by this fellow. And uh, uh, he uh, befriended the Prince of Wales. He, he robbed Vanderbilts and, uh, and other uh, famous names of the, of the era. And uh, so it's, it's a really great story. And uh, um, so I call it uh, uh, Catch Me If You Can meets The Great Gatsby. Uh, I guess with a with a with a side order of uh, the great Netflix series Lupin, because uh, um, there was a there's a famous uh, uh, fictional uh, gentleman jewel thief called Raffles, who was popular around the turn of the century, and Arthur Berry was uh, became famous as the American Raffles, this kind of a debonair uh, gentleman crook who, uh, um, if you can think to the time. Um, and if you could just think to the situation, um, he wasn't exactly a folk hero, but heading into the Depression, a fellow who robbed rich people of something as, well, let's face it, I mean, jewelry is a status symbol. You don't need it. You can't live in it. You can't drive it. You just wear it to flaunt your wealth. A fellow who was stealing this kind of, of, uh, of valuable from uh, the elite of New York uh, certainly, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, cheering out there for uh, his exploits. <laughs> you know, one of those criminals who uh, you you uh, that's sort of a hero criminal. I, I keep having this when you were talking about him. I was thinking of Cary Grant. I don't know. <laughs> oh yes, to catch a thief, exactly. And yeah. I, I reference that. I mean, there's a whole. Uh, uh, true, uh, true crime, but also fictional uh, uh, genre. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You know, if you've ever seen the movie, which apparently nails him. He was, he prided himself. He didn't kill anybody, and uh, he tried not to hurt anybody. You know, and uh, what actually uh, there's a, and again, he's like he's like Butch Cassidy. There's supposedly an incident where Butch gets onto a train. And uh, they go through the passenger cars because they want to get to the uh, the vault where the the rich person's money is, and everyone's handing him uh, money and uh, watches, and he's going, "I don't want your money. I want theirs." <laughs> and uh, and uh, so there's that aspect to it. I mean, Arthur Berry robbed from the rich. He didn't give to the poor. He gave mostly to gambling dens, as it turned out. <laughs> um, but anyway, there's there's more on the on the story on my website and. Uh, I'm hoping that's a 2024, 2025 release. Oh, uh, sounds I'm good. Certainly, I'm certainly trying to meet my deadline, of course. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Uh, so what's your most recent book that you have out then? Well, I uh, the um, uh, one of the things I'm doing is I'm trying to, uh, I'm now doing something a little more lighthearted than the hunt for a Victorian era serial killer, uh, the case of the murderous Dr. Cream. Uh, this uh, just came out in uh, 2021. And it's the story of a Canadian doctor uh, in the Victorian era who uh, 
usually using poison, murdered at least 10 people in Canada, the United States, and then finally in London, England. So um, as the subtitle says, the hunt for a Victorian era serial killer, um, I was fascinated by how this fellow got away with so many crimes in so many places so often. I mean, he even stood trial for one murder and was acquitted. You know, he was put in prison for 10 years and then paroled so he could kill again. So uh, it was a it was a real uh, deep dive into the forensic uh, forensics of the time, the, the state of detection at the time, but also again the misogyny and uh, the uh, second uh, or the the mistreatment of women at the time, because uh, he made it known he was an abortionist, and some of the women, many of the women who came to him. Uh, came to him uh, desperate for an illegal abortion at a time when uh, having a child out of wedlock was considered what one uh, one observer called a living death. And uh, he betrayed their trust. He convinced them that medicine would help them uh, abort the child, but he was poisoning them. So there was a real uh, um, uh, a real undercurrent there. Of, of hatred of women and attitudes towards women that uh, played a very big part because that's, uh, um, you know, he was compared to Jack the Ripper. I mean, he was a poisoner and Jack the Ripper was a contemporary, at least when he was killing in London, England. Um, but unlike, you know, Jack the Ripper hunted down his victims, Thomas Neil Crean, they came to him. So it was this huge betrayal of trust. He was a doctor. I mean, he was a, a well-trained uh, medical school graduate with uh, a license from the University of Edinburgh, uh, which was the top license granting uh, medical school on the, on the, on the planet. <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle was, was a student there at about the same time. Uh, so it was a, a really uh, interesting story about privilege status, uh, the, uh, the denigration of women, and uh, which were big factors in why he was able to kill and kill again, almost with impunity. Yeah, yeah. Well, that whole trust factor. I mean, you know, you, the, these people are in these positions of trust, and uh, that I guess that's one way they keep going and going and going and committing their crimes. No one's going to think that they're doing anything. Right. So I'm decompressing now with the story of a gentleman jewel thief. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah, I know. It's exactly. Like I, I kind of referred like in um, in the uh, Unsolved Crimes and Mysteries, the piece that I wrote was about a uh, mysterious death of a film actor. And I said, I'm kind of like comic relief after some of the other stories in the book. Well, there's no such thing as a victimless crime, but uh, um, the story I'm doing now just uh, just has so many almost laugh out loud moments. I mean, the audacity of this yeah. fellow and uh, some of the uh, crimes he engineered. And uh, I haven't even gotten to the, uh, the prison break, the uh, implication of the Lindbergh kidnapping and a whole bunch of other things that happened to him oh uh, as time goes on. And uh, yeah, he was, he's a very much a, a larger than life character and uh um, there's some myth making certainly afterwards and even at the time, but I'm uh, I'm doing my best to go back to as many contemporary sources as I can, and uh, you know tell the as true as possible story about this this fellow and uh, um, and I'm finding that many of the outlandish things he supposedly did are, are true. Wow, that's well. Yeah, it's like the uh, the uh, piece you did in the well mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. That guy was uh, 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 there were laugh out loud moments in that too. So, oh, the yellow kid, yeah, yeah, the, uh, yes. Joseph Wheel, the yeah, no, uh, he was a, a huge uh, well, he's a huge figure in the in the uh, history of of uh, con men. One because he uh, he had a ghostwriter do his life story. <laughs> uh, which of course made him famous and I, I think I, I was able to show even for a shorter article like in 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 your book Mitzi that uh, you know he he fudged the facts to make himself look better but he has one of the greatest rationales uh, for a con man that in history and uh, he just when he was saying you know do you have any guilt or anything well he said well people came to me they wanted something for nothing I just gave them nothing for something <laughs> 
<laughs> that is a brilliant line. The 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 the, 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 pro, the, the proverb to live by for all con artists. I exactly. Guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And oh unfortunately, still true today. Yeah. Uh, anyone's into cryptocurrency, they might want to remember that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, things don't change. They just get more sophisticated and the, and the vehicles used are more sophisticated, but it's, it's all the same. So, well, um, I'm really glad you were able to come on with me today. Um, again, uh, this story is uh, the curious case of the dogs in the nighttime, Francis Valley of Hell mystery from the best new true crime stories, unsolved crimes and mysteries. And I've been speaking with Dean Job, uh, who's my thrice contributor to the series. Well, Mitzi, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on and thanks to everyone who tunes in. And uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, uh, making it a trio. <laughs> Thank you. And um, good luck with the new book. It sounds like it's going to be a good one. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's uh, okay. I hope so. Yeah. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye.